We've been talking about getting to 1 Kings, and I made that announcement about two weeks ago, and we're finally here. Praise the Lord. If you are a checkers player, then you're familiar with this little idea that if you've played checkers, the goal is to get to the very end of the board strategically. And if you have successfully accomplished that goal, you say to your your opponent, king me. And what they do is they take an extra checker and they place it on top of your current checker and it almost looks like a crown. And so once you have been kinged, you have a certain amount of authority. You have power. You can go into any direction you like to on the board. And this same concept applies to today's text, the first Kings chapter 1, verses 1 through 10, entitled King Me. And in this text, we'll see three main points. The dying king, verses 1 through 4. The false king, verses 5 through 10. And the true king, verses 10b, or the last part of verse 10. In the Hebrew Bible, there is no division between first and second kings. In our English Bible, there is a division. That's why we have first kings. We have second kings. But in the Hebrew Bible, there is no division. It's just one book. And the same content that we have in our English Bible, as it relates to the Old Testament, is the same content in the Hebrew Bible. It is just organized and set up in a different way. The Hebrew Bible of 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings, those two books are deeply connected. So if you want to understand 1st and 2nd Kings in a better way, then you need to start reading in 1st and 2nd Samuel because those two books are deeply connected. In the Hebrew Bible, the Jews would look at 1st and 2nd Samuel as 1st Kingdom, 2nd Kingdom, And then 1st and 2nd Kings would be considered 3rd Kingdom and 4th Kingdom. That's how it's organized in their Bibles. So I want to encourage you, as we go through 1st and 2nd Kings, you start reading 1st and 2nd Samuel. That will help you in your Bible preparation. According to scholars, uh, the whole book of 1st and 2nd Kings was completed in the year 550 B.C. 550 B.C. That was during the midpoint of the Babylonian Exile, when God's people were exiled. And so the author, according to Jewish tradition and custom, the author is the prophet Jeremiah. And when we look at First and Second Kings, uh, we need to understand that we read First and Second Kings much differently than what I had been preaching through, which is First and Second uh, Timothy or First Timothy. 1 Timothy is an epistle. The way you read that genre as a letter is different than this type of genre. 1 Kings is primarily historical narrative, meaning it's the history of the monarchy. It's the history of Israel and Judah. And the way that you read these two types of biblical literature is important because we want to be faithful to the Word of God. We want to understand this text in the way that the original audience would have understood it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit with the original author. So this is important. So we are reading primarily historical narrative. It's a story. It's a history of Israel and Judah regarding the monarchy. Which leads to the main point. The main point that you'll see in your bulletins is this, that unbridled sin leads to ungodly kings. And queens. Unbridled sin leads to ungodly kings and queens. So, point number one the dying king in verses one through four. Well, if you've read the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, and you read the life of uh, David, this is prior to his kingship, when David was young, he was handsome, he was strong. He was energetic. He killed lions and bears to protect the flocks of his father. He also killed a massive giant, Goliath. 
And every kingdom that went against David during his kingship, God blessed the work of his hands. David conquered all those foreign kingdoms, all his enemies. That's all by God's kindness and grace. And, but that was when David was young. Now he's King David, and he's about 70, 75, maybe 80 years old, and the tables have turned. It's amazing what happens to a person when you add a few years to their life. So he is at the end of his life. He's at the end of his reign. He is old, and he is cold, and he cannot get warm. And so his servants provide extra clothes or extra blankets. But all of that accounts for nothing. He is still cold. And so his servants come up with this great solution. His servants say, well, let's find a servant that will lie down next to the king, King David, and raise his body temperature. In other words, let's find a human blanket known as a servant or known as a nurse. Verse 2 says, Let her lie in your arms that my lord the king may be warm. Ancient medical practice was to take a young healthy body that had a certain body temperature and put that healthy body next to and in bed with the unhealthy body to nurse them, to help them to keep them warm, and so that's why they recommend this. And so what's implied is King David goes along with the idea of his servants, and so they go on this trajectory or on this project to find a nurse. But this is not just any kind of nurse. This is a certain type of nurse. This nurse was obviously a woman, but just not any type of woman, but a young woman, as the text states, this young woman is a virgin. That's the idea. A young woman, not just any woman, a young woman who is a virgin. But not just any woman. This woman wasn't ugly. This woman was beautiful. This woman was not just beautiful, but she was very beautiful, as the text says in verse 3 and 4. And so they're looking for this beautiful young virgin nurse to help King David raise his body temperature. And in many ways, this raises more questions than the Bible has answers for. It seems as they were in the process of finding this young, beautiful virgin nurse, it's almost like the Miss Israel beauty pageant-esque. Why? Because... His servants searched all the territory of Israel and found Abishag, the Shunammite, and brought her to King David. If you look at a map, Shunem is 60 miles north of the city of Jerusalem. So his servants couldn't go down to the local gate of the city where people come in and out to do business or go to the local synagogue. They went 60 miles north. That doesn't sound like a long journey, but if you don't have a car, it is a long journey. And so, they searched all the territory, and by God's providence, they found this young, very beautiful virgin nurse named Abishag. Someone spent a lot of time, money, energy, on this great journey and endeavor to find the perfect nurse. And so the text says that they found Abishag and she was of service to the king and attended to him. She was very useful to the king. She was beneficial to the king. She was a faithful servant to the king. But what's interesting is at the end of verse 4, the author of 1 Kings says something very interesting that he wants the original audience to be aware of. And it is this. The king knew her not. The king knew her not. In other words, even though this young, beautiful virgin nurse was in the same bed as King David, there was no sexual intimacy, no sexual intercourse. There was no sex involved. King David stayed pure, 
as it relates to this young woman. King David understands sin. And King David understands sexual sin. When we look at 2 Samuel, when King David slept with and committed adultery with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. And so this sin of sexual sin, King David is not foreign to. He understands what that is in a very real way. And all sin is an affront against God. King David says it like this, after he has been confronted by the prophet Nathan for his sexual immorality, his adultery. King David says this in Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. King David understands his sin. He says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. King David doesn't try to pass the buck. He doesn't try to deny responsibility. He understands sin, especially sexual sin. And in Psalm 51, he confesses his sin before the Lord. He understands that sin is a violation of God's will and God's law. And David confessed his sin and he begs God to forgive him. And the God of David is the God of the universe. The Bible's very clear that the God, the true and living God, is a forgiving God. He's a forgiving God to those who confess their sins and trust in him. And in the same chapter of Psalm 51, verse 17, David says this, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. It's not a sheep. It's not an oxen. It's not cattle. But the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. This is David's status. This is where David lands This is where David is in his life. He understands that sin is wickedness and affront and a violation of God's law. And now at the end of his life, King David understands that it's a broken and contrite heart. God does not despise. And so he doesn't sleep with this young, beautiful, virgin, woman, nurse. Is that amazing that God forgives. I've said this once, I'll say it a million times. I'm not amazed that God judges. I read the word of God and I expect him to judge because he is holy. He has to judge. To not judge sin is to violate his nature and his will and his word and his own holiness. So I'm not surprised when God judges. I'm surprised God forgives. I'm God's, I am surprised that God forgives sinners, wicked sinners like David. I'm surprised that God forgives wicked sinners like you and me and us. But yet it's God who forgives those who are broken in spirit, contrite of heart, those who are genuinely broken over their sins. Is that you, dear Christian? Christian brother, Christian sister, are you broken over your sin? Or do you treat God's law flippantly? You treat God as common when in reality, he is uncommon. Do you treat God as holy? God forgives. He forgives those who are broken in spirit and contrite of heart. Those who put their hope and confidence in him. Who trust God at his word. So King David is at the end of his life, he's end of his reign. And if we are part of that original audience and we're reading this historical narrative, what we would ask ourselves is this, who is the next king? Who is the next king? Will God remain faithful to his word and to his promise and to his people? Who is going to be next? 
Will he be faithful to the house of David? And so this situation provides a wonderful opportunity for the false king, which is point number two. And we see this in verses 5 through 10. Adonijah is the fourth son of David. It goes Amnon, Absalom, uh, then Adonijah. So Adonijah, he's the oldest surviving son after the death of Absalom. The Bible is clear that this son is not a son from his wife Bathsheba, but from a woman, another wife named Haggith. And since Adonijah is the oldest surviving son, because the other three sons are out of the picture at this point, Adonijah believes that he's the next in line to the throne. And if we go according to the ancient principle of primogenitor, which is the firstborn son, he is the son, he's the oldest son, he's the living son. He's the only son that, from a natural perspective, would have a chance or opportunity to the throne as the next king. But God doesn't always choose the oldest son, does he? No. When we look at David, who became King David, David was the youngest. God did not choose the oldest in that family. God chose the youngest, which is David, in 1 Samuel 16. And in God's wisdom, it's not Adonijah who is the next king. Solomon is the next king. Solomon was chosen by God to be the next king in 1 Chronicles 22. So, why would God do that? Why would God not choose Amnon? Why would God not choose uh, Adonijah? Why would God choose none of these other sons? Because God chose Solomon because God made a covenant or a promise with David that David's throne, David's family, David's line would be continued. That his throne, his kingdom would be established eternally. And we see that in 2 Samuel chapter 7. 2 Samuel chapter 7. So what is Adonijah, Adonijah doing? He's in the wings, he's in the shadows, he's watching his father from a distance, and he sees that his father's health is failing. So what does Adonijah do? He exalts himself, he lifts himself in rank and in status. He says, I will be king. In other words, king me. And so Adonijah, once he makes that declaration, he wants everybody to know about it. He holds nothing back. He wants everybody to know that he is the king. So what does he do? As a prideful king, he sends out his gang. He sends out his posse. He sends out his entourage. And in verse 5, we see chariots and horsemen. These chariots and horsemen are trained, skilled military folks within the army. These trained military folks have massive horses that are connected to chariots. Massive horses, intimidating horses, connected to two-wheel chariots. Plus, he doesn't choose three men to tell the people. He chooses 50 men to go before him as his royal guard, as his heralds, to tell the people that he is king. Isn't it interesting that prideful people do not like to remain quiet. They do not like to remain low-key. Prideful people, and in this case, prideful kings, want everybody to know who they are, that they have authority and power, and what they're going to do. And so when we build on a very personal basis, when we're more concerned about our own personal kingdoms, instead of God's kingdom, what we're actually saying is, king me. And if you're a female, queen me. We're more focused on our kingdom 
than God's kingdom. How do we know that? Well, I would suspect that most of us are on social media of some form. Are you telling the world what you eat for breakfast and the car that you're driving and the house that you built with your own hands and the house that you purchased and the next beautiful place you want a vacation? I'm not saying anything of those types are inherently evil. But what are we actually saying when we promote to the world what we have and what we're doing instead of what God has done and who God is and what God has done in Christ for us? Aren't we functionally building our own kingdoms and saying, King me? Men, when we have a promotion at work and the boss is patting us on the back and he gives us all sorts of awards and accommodations, do we tell the world this is by God's grace and God's kindness? Or do we say, yes, I deserve this. I worked hard with my own hands. We're saying, king me. Or queen me. Or parents. When other Christians or other folks say to us, oh, your children are perfect. They're so submissive. They're so obedient. They never, they're never out of place. They never speak out of turn. And we say, yes, I've been training my child for the last 10 years. And we don't give any glory to God. We don't give God credit for strengthening us through all those difficult years of parenting. Aren't we saying, king me or queen me? How about when we're not sharing the gospel, when God gives us opportunities by his grace? Aren't we saying, king me? Because our time is more important than God's time. So Adonijah has an entourage, and he wants everybody to know that he is king and that he is going to self-coronate, that he's going to take the crown. And so why is Adonijah self-promoting? Why does he do that? Why is he self-coronating? Well, part of the reason is that he sees his father dying. He's the oldest surviving last son. And so he sees an opportunity. But if we look at verse 6, here's the other reason why Adonijah is taking the throne. His father had never at any time displeased him by asking, Why have you done thus and so? He was also a very handsome man, and he was born next after Absalom. It seems that the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree. Adonijah was handsome, just like his father, David. And Adonijah was a royal son. He had prestige, and he had influence, and he had good looks. That's very, that's very beneficial in politics, isn't it? But the real issue is King David never parented his son, Adonijah. King David was a father, but King David was not a parent. David was probably one of the greatest kings in all of the Old Testament, in the history of Israel and Judah. However, he was a delinquent father. He was a great king, but he was a terrible dad. He never displeased Adonijah. That word displeased can be translated grieved. King David never grieved his son Adonijah ever in his life. In other words, King David never challenged his son when his son sinned against the Lord. David never asked, why have you done this, son? Why are you committing this Sin, son. Why have you violated God's word and God's law, son? What are you doing, son? David never questioned or disciplined any of his children, including Adonijah. He never biblically parented Adonijah. Adonijah grew up in a royal home, 
He did whatever he wanted to do. He said whatever he wanted to say. He had no reins, no limitations, no barriers. And so when you add royal prestige and influence and very good looks and no godly character because there's no biblical parenting, what do you end up with? You end up with an ungodly son. For our purposes, that applies to ungodly daughters as well. There's no godly character whatsoever. This is the epitome of Adonijah did what was right in his own eyes. No one stopped him. No one challenged him. No one questioned him. Not even his own father. One of the greatest kings in the Old Testament, but a terrible dad. And in 2 Samuel, we see that the sons of David, in chapter 13, Amnon commits sexual sin with his half-sister Tamar. If you read that story in 2 Samuel chapter 13, Amnon actually rapes his half-sister. David knows about it. King David, the father, knows about it and challenges, does not challenge his son. Then Absalom commits murder in 2 Samuel chapter 13. He kills his own brother, Amnon. David knows about it, and King David does what? Does nothing. Doesn't challenge his son. Then Absalom, in chapter 15, is a handsome man, and he decides, I will be king. It's interesting that Adonijah follows the footsteps of his older brother, Absalom. And so he, Absalom, decides to take the throne from his father in chapter 15. And what does King David do? Nothing. Again. Great king, terrible father. And King David, he was supposed to teach all his children, especially his sons, the ways of God. In Deuteronomy 6, God's people are charged to teach the people, especially their children, all the ways of the Lord. The law of God explains who God is and what God requires and how they are to honor God with their lives. So parents, please listen. What are you doing to raise your children with godly character? You're responsible for your child or children, and I'm responsible for my child and children. I can help you, and you can help me. But at the end of the day, you're going to give an account to the Lord for the way you raise your children. Is the internet raising your children? Is YouTube raising your children? Is Netflix raising your children? Or are you raising your children? What are you teaching your children? Do you teach them the holiness of God? Do you teach them the gospel of Jesus Christ? What are you actually teaching them? We know that the internet world is a dangerous world. If you click in one wrong fashion, the internet will tell, take you to a place that you don't want to go. And it'll charge you a price that you're unwilling to pay because you don't have enough money. It will lead you down the road of sin, especially sexual sin, if you're not careful. Pornography is a major sin, not only in the world, not only in America, but also in the church. On a very practical level, this church, in terms of the building, is locked down internet-wise. Why? That's to protect me. That's to protect Pastor Ed. That's to protect our staff. That's to protect everybody who comes through these doors. It's to protect them from the evil that's out there. Yes, I understand that the internet can be used for good. But most of the time, if we're honest, most Christians don't use the internet for good. And so this church is locked down on the internet or in the internet because we care for people. But what are you teaching your children, parents? Do you expect the pastoral team here to do all the parenting for you on one hour a day, one day out of seven? If you run the numbers, those aren't good. 
It's you that sees your child every single day. You're the one who provides food for them. You're the one who cares for them. Teach them the word of God, dear parents. Teach them the law of God. Teach them what honors God and what dishonors God. Parents, if you don't know how to biblically parent, then I want to encourage you, find an older Christian brother or sister who's been part of this church family for a while, who understands the sacrifice and the commitment to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and ask them to help you. Ask them, will you spend time with me? Can we have coffee together? I want to ask you questions. If you don't like that option, come to Wednesday nights at 6.30. We're going through a 13-week class on parenthood. How to raise our children biblically. And this applies to singles as well. See, most singles won't go to a parenting class because they think that, well, I'll learn exactly what I need to learn as soon as I get married. I would probably disagree with that idea. Why? Because you want to know well in advance what it takes, the commitment and sacrifice that it takes to raise children God's ways. Parents, be reminded of Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Parents, it's not a sin to discipline your children. It's a sin to abuse your child, but it's not a sin to discipline your child. And this text says, whoever spares the rod, the literal translation, hates his son. By extension, that applies to daughters. The problem that we have as parents is that we look at our three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, and we think that they're adults. And we talk to them on the level of adults. And we say to them, I'm going to give you to the count of three to... Shape up. Otherwise, you're going to ship out. And so what we've done is we count one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. Okay, here comes the rod. And what you've actually done passively and unknowingly is you've trained your child delayed obedience. I can obey you on my time frame, not your time frame. And then we say, obey God. But you've already programmed your child for 18 years that delayed obedience is A-OK. Because why it was A-OK with you? You'll never see that in the Holy Scriptures, that delayed obedience is A-OK. When God commands His people to obey, they're called to obey now. Not in three seconds, not in three days, and not in three weeks. Parents, if you don't discipline your children, the Bible says you actually hate your children. And so we think, oh, that's harsh. Is that literal? Yes, that's literal. But the one who actually loves his child disciplines them. Hear me, parents, not abuses them. Let's not get abuse with discipline in the same word. Discipline means you're doing things in a biblical way that's honoring to God, and yet you're laying down the law in a firm, gracious, loving way. So are you raising your children in a way that honors the Lord? Or do you let your children act up in public when they're in the store? Let's say Smith's. And because they don't get their Snicker, Snickers bar, they just they sprawl out on the floor and they kick and scream and cause a public riot at Smith's or Walmart. Right? That's not good. That's not right. That's not honoring to the Lord. If you love your child, you're going to discipline them. You should discipline them. I want to encourage you to discipline them. If you don't know what that means, you need to ask an older Christian who's gone through all the rough times and they learned the hard way, the right way to discipline their children. As a matter of practicality, parents, I know there's two schools of thoughts that some believe that we just let our children do whatever they want to do. And then when they turn 13, 14, 15, maybe 18 years old, and they have the strength of an adult now, and now you try to restrain them, 
It's not going to work. Why? Because you've given them a lot of freedom. You let them have liberty in their sin. What we're actually supposed to do is hold them and restrain them to follow the word of God. And as they get older, and they are obedient with right action and right heart, that doesn't mean that they're saved, but right action and right attitude, then you, keep, you can start raising your thumb off of their pulse and give them liberties. And then when they sin, guess what? You rein them back in until they can be trusted again to have more liberty. And then when they go into the world and they're college bound and they want to get married and have a family, guess what? You've raised a moral person. You've raised a godly person, even though they may not be saved. They fear the law of God. They're going to be a good citizen, productful. They're going to be a good neighbor. They're going to be a good worker. Why? Because you discipline them for good. Think about what you want your child to be 10, 15, 20 years down the road. So David was supposed to parent or discipline his children, but he did not. He had a proven track record of being a great king, but a terrible father. And so because he's, Adonijah sees his father dying, and because King David never disciplined Adonijah, now Adonijah says, I'm going to take the crown. I will be king. And to make sure that this happens, Adonijah counsels those who will support his case. In his entourage, we see this in verse 7, Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and Abiathar, the priest. Joab is a mighty army commander of Israel, and he's also known for his violence, that he was a harsh commander, he was a harsh man. And he used to support King David until Joab had Absalom murdered. Abiathar the priest is one of the two high priests that was appointed by King David. So what does Adonijah do? He finds people that will support his cause, and he intentionally talks to them and to them alone to help him become king, to take the throne. Joab's and Abiathar's position, if you think about it, a mighty army general, army commander, and a priest, high priest, those two positions, those two offices make a formidable team, make a dynamic duo. They make an influential group for the ascending king that Adonijah wants to be. Notice that Adonijah does not talk to. So he talks to two people, but did you notice who he did not talk to? He didn't talk to his own father, the current reigning king. He doesn't ask for fatherly advice. He doesn't talk to Nathan the prophet. He doesn't talk to Zadok the priest. As a matter of fact, he doesn't even talk to God himself. Adonijah's name translated is, My Lord is Yahweh. My Lord is Yahweh. In the Bible, biblical names have biblical definitions that represent the character of a person. And so when Adonijah's name means my Lord is Yahweh, he doesn't even talk to God. He doesn't talk to the one who created him. He violates God and he violates his own name. So Adonijah is very intentional about what he's doing. He doesn't talk to those people because why those people would oppose his kingship. They would oppose his plan. And in verse 8, we see the people who would line up with King David. Zadok the priest. He's one of the most influential high priests at that time. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. He is the equivalent of Joab, but on the other side of the fence. He is Joab's military rival. He's the commander of the royal guard. Nathan the prophet one of the prominent prophets and advisors to David. Shimei and Ray, these are court officials. And then lastly, David's mighty men. These are David's bodyguards. These are military heroes. These are soldiers, mighty soldiers and warriors. So Adonijah doesn't talk to any of those people. 
Adonijah's declaration of I will be king, and then he gets the right entourage, the right group, and he notifies others of his intention. Now the next step is we need to have a party. We need to have a celebration feast and sacrifice in verse 9. And when you look at this verse, what is sacrificed? Sheep, oxen, and fattened cattle. Not skinny cattle, but fattened cattle. Cattle are expensive, especially if they're fattened. And then you add sheep and oxen. This is a pricey, expensive event. This is an elaborate feast where everybody who attends this party is going to have a good time. They're going to eat very, very well. And this is a political event. This is a political ploy. Why? Because if I can get the right people into the right room and we have this wonderful meal together, all of these people will support me, Adonijah. He wants to be crowned as king, and he does this to enhance his reputation. But it's interesting where he sacrifices these animals. If you look at the text, it says the serpent stone besides En Rogel. The serpent stone. This is a stone that belongs to the serpent. People should realize just by that name alone that this is bad. This is not good. We should think of Genesis 3, that the serpent came into the garden to tempt Eve to sin. Anything that's connected to the serpent, most of the time is bad. It's evil. It's wicked. To sacrifice Sheep and oxen and fattened cattle on a stone that belongs to the serpent should raise red flags to God's people. This is not good. And it, this altar, this stone, is by Enrogel. Enrogel is south of the city. Enrogel has springs of water. And according to Jewish custom, this is the proper place to have a self coronation. This is the proper place to take the crown officially. To let the people know, I am king. And so who's invited to this party, this coronation party? We see this in verse 9. All of Adonijah's brothers, the king's sons, and all the royal officials of Judah, which is a family slash political event. And Adonijah wants to make sure at all costs, that he is installed as king. So he invites only the people that will support him. But in verse 10, we see the people who are not invited to this party. Again, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah the commander of the royal guard, the mighty men, David's bodyguards. And if you look at the end of that list, at verse 10, it says Solomon. He is a brother that was not invited to this celebration feast. All the other brothers were, but not Solomon. Which leads to point number three. The true king, or we could label it the future king. That's at the end of verse 10. Solomon was, also, was always God's choice to be the king that would replace King David. Again, that reference is in 1 Chronicles chapter 22. Solomon is described in the scriptures as one of the wisest kings in the entire Old Testament. However, he's not the true king. When we see biblical words like prophet, for example, Nathan the prophet in verse 8, and priest, like Zadok the priest in verse 8, and the word king, like King David in verse 1, when we look at prophet, priest, and king, that language points to Jesus. Jesus. A prophet is one who would represent God to the people. He would say to the people in the Old Testament, you're sinning against God with your false worship. Idling or worshiping idols. Dead gods. You're sinning against God. A prophet would expose the sin of God's people. The prophet would say to the people, judgment is impending. It's on the way unless you repent. The prophet would warn of future judgment, but also 
of the coming Messiah, that there would be salvation, that there would be redemption. Jesus, as prophet, reveals God's wills, or God's will and God's ways. Jesus is the true prophet. When it comes to the priest, once a year, the high priest would make a sacrifice for God's people, for the forgiveness of sins, for all the sins that God's people would do over the year. And Jesus, as the high priest, is the mediator between God and man. A priest would represent the people to God. Jesus is that priest. He's the mediator between God and man. Hebrews 10, 3 and 4 says this, But in these sacrifices there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. When the scriptures talk about sacrifice and blood, ultimately that's fulfilled in Christ. Christ is the great priest. But also, when we look at king, a king, his responsibility was to copy God. In other words, the human king that God chose and established as the leader and ruler and king of his people, he was to be a deputy king under the ultimate king. The earthly king was to mimic or copy the true God and king. God as king. This king was to read the word of God daily and obey the scriptures. We see that in Deuteronomy 17. That's what a real king would do. And Jesus, as king, has all authority. He rules and reigns the entire cosmos, the entire universe, the entire creation, including humanity. So these three important offices of prophet, priest, and king in the Old Testament were conducted by different individuals, different people. But in the person and work of Jesus Christ, those three offices are combined in Jesus. Jesus is the greater prophet. Jesus is the greater priest. Jesus is the greater king. There's no one like Jesus. If we are Christians, and we are by God's grace, praise the Lord, what we're saying is God is king, and he is always king. If we're Christians, we're saying that Christ is king as well. And if Christ is the king, he deserves all our honor, loyalty, and obedience, dear Christian. We put ourselves under his authority and his power. Whatever he says, he, whatever he says in his word, we do. We obey. We are determined to do that. That's the point of the line in the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your what? Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. That's in Matthew 6. We are God's people by God's grace. God is king and always king. And he gave us his son, King Jesus, who rules and reigns now. And we are to pray that God's kingdom come, that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Kingdom people submit their own will to the true king. Kingdom people do not hold on to their will. Kingdom people come to God with an open hand and submit their will to God's will, to his authority, to his kingship. And if you think about it, we are God's people all by his grace. We've turned away from our sins. We've trusted in Jesus as the only Savior between God and man. He's the only mediator. He's the only one that can make us right in the eyes of the holy God. And we should praise God for that. We must praise God for that. So we are kingdom people. God is king. Christ is king. We submit ourselves to his authority and to his will. Are we doing that? On a real, practical, daily, Christian, daily living. Do we read God's word and obey it? Or we read God's word and we think it's fictional? 
It's a fairy tale. And we discard it and jettison it. And we don't believe it. And we disobey God by not obeying his word. If you're not a Christian, you're under God's wrath. You need to know that. You need to understand that God has every right to judge you for your sin. Why? Because he created you. He gave you the air that's in your lungs right now. He gave you the beat in your chest right now. He gave you gifts and skill sets to honor him, but you've used those same skill sets to honor yourself. You've said, king me, queen me. And when you die in your sin, you'll be judged for every single solitary sin that you've committed against the holy king. And God has every right to do that. So, you're encouraged, dear friend, to turn away from your sin and trust in Jesus, the true king. Submit your will and your ways to him. He is worthy of all glory. He's worthy of all honor. He's worthy of all praise. He is the true king, and there's no other king that can compare to him. If you want to know the bliss of forgiveness, you want to know the bliss of eternal life, you want to know the bliss of peace with God, it must be and only through Jesus Christ. Submit your will to him. Quit living in your sin. Quit living in sexual sin. Quit living for yourself. And turn to Christ Jesus. And then you'll know the peace that you've been searching for all your life. That's founded upon God's word in Christ. So Christian, King Jesus is our king. And we serve no other. Sermon in a sentence. True Christians submit to the true king. King Jesus. Do you believe that? Do you trust that? Are you intentional about that? He is your king. You are his child by his grace. Honor him with your life. Yes, this life is difficult. Yes, this life has struggles and challenges. Yes, there will be problems. But he is worth it. He's worth it. Don't be short-sighted. This is not a sprint. This is a marathon. He's worthy. Trust him. Honor him. He's the one that gave you his own life, his own righteousness. He died for you. And he was raised for you. And he rules and reigns right here, right now. Honor him with your life. Let's pray.